And now, it's time for the encouragement this morning from our pastor, Reverend John Scott. He needs no introduction. <laughs> so I'll just ask Reverend John Scott to give us his Father's Day encouragement. Reverend John. Thank you, Vance, and thank you, Mikkel, for that beautiful, beautiful uh, accompaniment to our, our singing this morning. Let's give him another big round of applause. <laughs> so happy Father's Day, all. Those of us who are fathers, grandfathers, godfathers, those of us who are fathers of our thoughts, those mothers who are fathers too, it's such a wonderful thing to celebrate the joy and the givingness and the love of fatherhood. So welcome, all those in the sanctuary and those who are with us online this morning. I would like to begin by asking the temple's newest dad, Ramon Pitta, to share with us all how his spiritual practice has impacted his role as a father. Ramon and his beautiful wife, Alea, gifted the family and the world with baby Ari Michel on April 6th. Perhaps he will let us into the secret of how he manages to even have a spiritual practice while helping Alea and Ari's big sister, Senna, take care of the newest family member. Ramon? Oh, is Senna coming with you? And to this, to this microphone. Hi, Senna. Father's Day, fathers that are here, the fathers that aren't here. Um, I, can everybody hear me? No? Lo I have to speak louder? Oh, there we go. So I have, to, I have to get a little bit closer here. Better? All right, fantastic. So I thought I would start the morning by telling you a story of the, the eight-year-old me. And, um, you know, the eight-year-old me would get into negotiations with my mother um, about doctor visits because according to her I thought that the doctors didn't respect my time um, I would ask her questions like how is it that we set a time and yet we still have to wait when we have made a mutual commitment to when we would meet right and so do <laughs> doctor visits required constant convincing um, in my family for me to attend at least and why do I tell you that story so it, it gives you a window into the type of person that I was at eight. Um, a little bit intense, um, <laughs> highly structured, you know, very much a, a planner. I would look ahead and, and, and most of those things actually continued into fatherhood. And, and some of them were actually really good. Um, but, but one of the things that I want to focus on is, you know, I had very much a need for control right, control of the external environment, e even at a very, very early age. So if you're lucky in life, you know, you encounter moments that make you realize that that's probably not the way that you should live, <laughs> right? And, and also better moments that force you into the realization that, you know, you're not in control of your life. You're not in control of, of everything and there's no way for you to influence all the various factors in your life. So I've been fortunate to have many of those moments um, and, and by my most recent experience was probably one of the most profound that I've had throughout my life and it took me on the spiritual journey which changed not only who I was as an individual but especially who I was as a father and continues to change that. You know, Reverend, I still remember I was in that bookshop and, and asking Reverend John a lot of questions and um, him pointing me to texts. And, and he said something to me that, you know, I, I still remember today, which is that, oh, you're on the beginning of your spiritual journey. And I've always remembered that very moment. <laughs> um, so 
what happened and, and what did I learn? So that's, that's really the main point. Um, well, for the first time in my life during you know, this moment that I talk, told you about, I had a few months to reflect and to read and to ask questions about life. Um, I'd never really stopped you know, since I was a child. I tell you about that intensity, right? So I never took a couple of months off before and I finally was forced to sit down for months and, and, and question and reflect. And what the journey that I, I went on was I came out on the other side was some, some personal revelations. And in particular, two dramatic changes, right? And they were all about what I focused on going forward. So the first is my focus has changed from external control to internal control. So no longer you know, did I try to control, control the variables outside of my control, but I worked on me. I worked on internal, my faith, how I viewed the world. You know, through meditations and, and really focusing on the things I consumed and let into my consciousness, you know, I, I really started to change you know, how I interacted with the external world. And some beautiful things started happening. Things started to align, not just for me personally, but for my entire family. And the more I focused on internal, is the more things continued to align. So I'm also a fairly analytical person. And so you know, to the person who's analytical, you might hear these things and say, well, what is he talking about? This is kind of hocus pocus, right? Um, Here's my observation, and, and I think I'll leave this statement here with, for everyone, um, but it requires unpacking probably over years. But I don't believe that we've tapped the surface yet on this human condition and what we are able to manifest through the connection with ourselves and the or orchestrator of all things. I think we are fairly just scratching the surface on that. And hopefully, I'll continue to develop as I grow and learn throughout the years. So the next focus change that happened was actually the big one for my family, which is I went from a focus of hoping and even you know, controversially praying to a focus on knowing. And knowing for me is what I would consider the new word for what my faith is. So in the context of my family, I know that all the right people for my daughters are act to achieve their purpose in life are either here or will be brought into their lives at the appropriate time. I know that only good would envelop them because that's all we're focused on as a family. We don't care about what is going on externally, right? We, we don't worry about those things. And the last one is just knowing that if you believe truly that the maker of the cosmos and the giver of all life can do all these things, then surely allowing my children to walk the path that they have already intended for them is really easy. I just have to get out of the way. So here's the, the best part. By letting go of all of that external control, my life has become easier. Let me stress. Not easy, <laughs> I have two young, young daughters, um, but easier. And certainly easier than what I did before, which was to spend all my energy trying to control everything around me. And also because I'm no longer worried about the outcome anymore. Remember what I told you before about knowing. I know what the outcome is because I've already visualized it. I can now relax and focus on the journey. And isn't that what life is all about? Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Ramon. You have had the encouragement. Instead of worrying and focusing on what's outside, let us go within and work on ourselves. 
What a message. And then, as he says, your life becomes easier. Easier in the f doesn't mean that you don't have challenges and things to accomplish and things you want to do, but easier because you stop the fight. As we say in Jamaica, you stop nyamming up yourself and going with the flow. You know, there's a lovely, lovely image I have of, remember when we used to sing, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream? All you remember it? Let us sing it. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. So you know, friends, if you get into the, into the this, this stream and you put your raft or your canoe in or your rubber tire and you start rowing upstream, you're going to be struggling. So the thing to do is to learn, as Ramon has shared, to go with the flow. And you go with the flow by going within and allowing what he called the creator, the architect, the author of all life, to direct your way and your journey and your path. It's interesting that Ramon uh, started his talk with age eight, because I remember my brother Dennis I was eight, so he was about 12. He, well, not about, he was 12, he was four years older than I. Um, we had been put, given the task on a Father's Day by our mom because she had no money to buy a gift. So she said, Johnny, you make a card and Dennis, you write a poem for daddy. And Dennis being a very intense young man, I love what Ramon said, maybe we're related, Ramon. Um, Dennis looked up and said to dad, you know, Mothers nourish the newborn with mother's milk. What do fathers give their children? And without hesitation, my father, who was himself a poet of the soul, at least, he never wrote poetry, but he, he just loved poetry, said, fathers nourish their babies with the milk of human kindness. And in fact, they feed it to their entire families. And I didn't know at the time that he was quoting from Shakespeare's Macbeth when Lady Macbeth said, you, she read Macbeth's letter and said, I do fear thou art too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Um, but if, if a, a sentence or a phrase ever described somebody, the milk of human kindness described my dad. And so I've titled my encouragement this morning, Father Share the milk of human kindness. And my friends, I believe it is a time in human history when more than ever we need the milk of human kindness. We need to follow the master teacher, Jesus' uh, commandment to love one another. And fathers have an important role to play in modeling kindness and consideration for others. Author Washington Irving observed, and I quote, a kind heart is a fountain of gladness, making everything in its vicinity freshen into smiles. A kind heart is a fountain of gladness, making everything in its vicinity freshen into smiles. So important is kindness, my friends, in daily living that the Talmud, a series of rabbinical writings put together uh, from the first through the, the sixth century of the common era, uh, wrote the following, deeds of kindness are equal in weight to all the commandments. Deeds of kindness are equal in weight to all the commandments. But before you can be a chalice for the milk of human kindness and offer it to others, you have to be kind to yourself, don't? A lot of times, we see to the welfare and safety of parents, spouses, children, lovers, friends, even our pets are pampered sometimes, and spoiled beyond words, and yet we neglect ourselves emotionally. Sometimes people come here to me for counseling, and I wonder how they got to the temple because they are running on empty, in fact, sometimes only on fumes. But I see in the Jamaican people that, that kernel, that seed of kindness and goodness. 
You know, if your car shuts down on the road, people will still stop who know nothing about uh, modern computerized automobiles and say, it looks like something wrong with it, sir, <laughs> and offer to help. We have within us that kernel of goodness which is needs nurturing so that it can grow and blossom and bear fruit in our country and in fact across the world. And so when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, I think what he was really saying was you can only love your neighbor as much as you, as you love yourself. So I want you to begin today to be kind to yourself in thought, word, and deed. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 advises us, and I quote, clothe yourselves as the elect of God with compassion and kindness. Clothe yourselves as the elect of God with compassion and kindness. So here is your, your first assignment. Every morning as you are dressing for work or school, or if you're going, um, not going to work but staying home, and you're just putting on your clothes for the day, affirm, I clothe myself with compassion and kindness. Can we say that together? I clothe myself with compassion and kindness. In a half voice, I clothe myself in compassion and kindness. In a whisper, I clothe myself in compassion and kindness. And now say it in your heart and feel it. The second part of your assignment, my friends, is to share the milk of human kindness this week. No matter what you do or where you live, commit to making kindness a priority in your life this week. Whether you are a student or a busy professional or engaged in a, in, a, in a trade or work as a homemaker, make it a daily goal to speak and act kindly. You know, sometimes, even in our own community, uh, we will, as all families do, have disagreements and teeth and tongue will meet. But you know, you can express your displeasure without becoming acidic and a serb, you know, just, just the vitriol sometimes. Express your displeasure or your disapproval, but with kindness, with love, so that love is always the foundation of what you are communicating, even if it is your displeasure. So the third area for sharing the milk of human kindness I want to share with, leave with you this morning is to freely offer this kindness in the form of gratitude. One of the members of our temple named her, her townhouse Gratitude. So when you say, where do you live? She says, I live in gratitude. I love that. Let us foster the milk of human kindness and share it with, with others by expressing gratitude. And start at home. You know, express your gratitude for the person who prepared the meal. Express your gratitude to your children. In fact, even your pets respond to good girl or good boy. Um, I just had to do that with mine when a, a, a gift bag that I was going to put somebody's gift in, I left it on the bed and when I came out of the shower it was in shreds, you know, and I wasn't at all happy, so we had a stern discussion about it. And you could see the look of pain on her face as she looked up into, you know, into my eyes. It's irresistible. And when I was finished, you know, I, I let, let a little time pass so she wouldn't be confused. She had to know that she had done wrong. And then I said, come here. And she came and I said, sit. And she sat. And I gave her a treat and said, good girl. And you just, could just see her countenance change. So animals and even plants respond to our, our, our words of approbation and, and gratitude and, and congratulation. Um, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, a Hasidic master, wrote and I quote, it's easy to criticize others and make them feel unwanted. Anyone can do it. What takes effort and skill is picking them up and making them feel good. Let us pick up people and make them feel good this week. My friends, it's a powerful idea that we can choose to be kind. We can 
absolutely choose to dance with life, to sing it, to share it, and not just with those close to us, but with strangers who pass us on the path. You may never know how life-affirming your kindness has been just to someone who you said a kind word to who was waiting in, the, in the, the doctor's waiting room or in the queue at the bank or at the supermarket. So make yourself a conduit through which the milk of human kindness flows to nourish the people on your path. Let us say together, I am a clear and grateful conduit through which the milk of human kindness flows. Can, I, can we say that? I am a clear and grateful conduit through which the milk of human kindness flows. Together? I am a clear and grateful conduit through which the milk of human kindness flows. I manifest God's love through me today. I manifest God's love through me today. Someone posted this tribute to fathers by an anonymous writer on the Census for Spiritual Living Ministers um, group, and I wanted to share it with you today. Listen with your heart. Today is for the fathers. It is for the grandfathers, uncles, brothers, friends, and sons. For the most important man in anyone's life the one who gave us life. Here's to you, the dads who play endless games of go fish with their kids and always let them win, and those who always played to win every time, thinking that their children would grow stronger through defeat. This is for the fathers who worked in fields and factories, taught in classrooms or sat in office cubicles eight long hours a day. Here's to those who performed life-saving surgery and those who drove their truck through long days and nights. Here's to those who loved every minute of their labor and to those who only worked so their families would survive. To the sleepless dads who have waited in silent fear that their babies wouldn't make it through the night or their teenagers survive their first time driving alone. Those who lost children and those who found them in different ways. Here's to tears not shed and hugs not given for fear of appearing weak. Here's to dads who built with hammer and saw and those who wouldn't know how, that's like me. The families who are afraid of, the, the fathers who are afraid of spiders and in Jamaica lizards and yet can stay and slay the great dragon of fear in his little ones. The father who tried and those who didn't. The fathers who gave us life and walked away and those who stayed long past the life of their marriage to give something to the children. Here's to the fathers who loved their children's mother and to those who no longer could. The fathers who hurt because their children have been kept from them and those who are both father and mother. Stay at home, dads, and stay away, dads, the one we wanted but never knew, the helpless, hurting father, and the brave, strong dad. And for all the ways of fatherhood, here's to you. You know, friends, there's a wonderful teaching story about two little boys who wanted to make a fool of a wise sage. He was the father of the, of the village, the village elder. And so they captured a young nightingale and with its tail feathers protruding from one of the little boy's cupped hands, they determined to ask the sage whether the bird was alive or dead. If he said it was dead, the little, boys would open his hand, the little boy would open his hands and let the bird fly free. And if the sage said it was alive, the captor would crush it and let it fall at the sage's feet. Either way, he would look like a fool in front of the gathered crowd. So when the villagers had gathered to listen to the sage's words of wisdom, the little wise Alex put their plan into action. Oh, wise one, they intoned, can you tell what I have in my hand? The sage replied, it seems from the tail feathers protruding from your hand that it's a nightingale. And is it alive? 
or is it dead? They asked with a smirk. The sage thought for a moment, and as a hush fell upon the gathering, he said with a kindly smile, it's in your hands, children. It's in your hands. And so my friends, the choice to go within that Ramon spoke about this morning is in your hands. The choice to say a kind word of love and laughter. Is mommy scared of lizards? Oh, well, you have to tell her that they are, they are God's little creatures and she needn't be, fr be frightened. <laughs> Isn't that just wonderful? They can have anything from me, you know, anything. <laughs> so the choice is, mommy afraid of lizards, to go within <laughs> and see them as God's little creatures. <laughs> it's in your hands. It's truly in your hands. My friends, the, the issuance of all love, peace, and human kindness comes from that life which smiles upon our world by smiling through our eyes, that uses us to share the milk of human kindness. Think of how impactful our lives can become when we know and live from the truth, sharing the milk of human kindness. And as the sage said so long ago, it's in your hands, children. It's in your hands. Namaste. <clears throat> Let us show our gratitude by giving Reverend John and Ramon another big round of applause. I just want to thank Ramon again for reminding us to go within and be mindful of what we allow into our consciousness so that we go on that important journey to get to knowing. So that's a journey well worth taking. And to Reverend John, um, we just have to affirm, I clothe myself with compassion and kindness. And let us just embody that, not only this week, but always, so that we become a channel of encouragement and kindness and gratitude. So again, thanks, Ramon. Thanks, Reverend John. And remember, it's in your hands.